Hello and welcome back today! Today I've missed you so much, it's been a while, I am so sorry about that. I miss you guys, but today we're back at it with another Kurzgesagt video. We're going to be watching the black hole that kills galaxies, quasars. Let's just hop right in. The universe looks like a vast, empty ocean sprinkled with rare islands of galaxies. That's true. But this is an illusion. Just a small fraction of all atoms are found in galaxies, while the rest is thought to be drifting in between oh, in the intergalactic matter. medium. Like the roots of some massive tree, gas spreads out from each galaxy, gravity funneling fresh mass into this dense cosmic forest. Mm -hmm. Here in the intergalactic medium are the raw materials of creation. If you ever seen any of those pictures of just some of the infrared light spectrums and whatnot, and you can kind of actually see it. it's almost like a web structure and it's kind of reminiscent of the structure of your body, which is odd, you know, at, at a cellular level and how your cells arrange themselves. So it's it kind of is very thought provoking. Hydrogen and helium woven into sheets and filaments that flow into galaxies where they eventually create stars. Ooh. But if we look closely, we see who's actually in charge. Quasars, star juice the single most powerful objects in existence a quasar as small as a grain of sand compared to the amazon river they reside in the centers of some galaxies shining with the power of a trillion stars that's a big number out huge jets of matter completely reshaping the cosmos around them <laughs> they're so powerful that they can kill a galaxy what are they and how do they mold the structure of the universe at their whim Quasars are pretty scary, to be fair. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. Everywhere you look, weird things in the sky. There's weird things everywhere. In the 1950s, astronomers noticed mysterious loud radio waves coming from spots all over the sky. They were named quasi-stellar radio sources, or quasars, because they were dots like stars, but were seen in radio waves rather than visible light. Ah. Everything about them was strange. Some flickered, others emitted high-energy x-rays in addition mm -hmm. to radio waves, but all seemed to be tiny. Quasar, they not moved to be confused fast, with the as pulsar. As over 30% the speed of light. The only explanation was that they must have been so distant that their apparent speed was actually the expansion of the universe moving them away from us. But oh. these enormous distances meant that quasars couldn't just be stars, but the active cores of galaxies billions of light years away. And it gets crazier. To appear so bright and loud, given these vast distances, they are thousands of times brighter than the entire Milky Way. Yeah, think about that. The amount of energy needed to be released in order to generate a brightness to be seen as bright as it saw from so far away. We'll never wrap our heads around that. Monsters exploding and screaming <laughs> into the void with a violence I like not that picture. thought possible before. As we mapped the sky, we discovered over a million quasars. Wow. So they're they not like super duper rare. Away. Looking into space far away means very long ago mm -hmm. because light takes so long to reach us. Quasars were common in the early universe, having peaked in number 10 billion years ago when galaxies and the universe itself were still very young. Ah. Let's go back in time, just three billion years after the Big Bang, and see what was going on back then. Okay. The incredible power of quasars. <laughs> Quasar smash! How could an early baby galaxy <laughs> be so incredibly bright and violent? All that light and radiation couldn't be stars, as there weren't nearly enough of them. Mm -hmm. And since galaxies tend to grow with time by merging, the starlight from small galaxies shouldn't be far brighter than any galaxy today. Makes a lot of There's sense. There's only one way to generate the vast amounts of energy a quasar shines with, feeding supermassive black holes. That's one of the things that actually absolutely interests me, is we have these set of rules that we've calculated on how big things should get, whether we're talking about stars or black holes or galaxies or anything, right? And there's exceptions to every single one of those rules. There's always something that we end up finding that makes us scratch our head and realize we have no idea what the heck we're talking about. No matter how good of a grasp we get on this universe, we always find something 
that pushes the limits of our understanding. And, and for one, that excites me. I find that extremely exciting. I don't think humanity will ever fully understand how the universe works from beginning to end. I don't think that's possible. But I do think we will have a very good grasp on it, right? It, you know, we're not meant for that kind of understanding, but we'll get kind of close. And every time we discover something like that and we have to readjust our theories or find an explanation, that's one step closer to that further understanding that our goal is, right? And that's just really exciting to me. I don't know. I love learning new things. So finding holes in a model that works and having to patch it, that's exciting. We still don't know how exactly they formed, but it seems that every galaxy has one in their center. But how can the brightest things in the universe be black holes? We have a whole which track video on that, actually. Everything that crosses their event horizon. Well, the light of a quasar is not coming from inside these black holes. That's, I'm sure they're going to go into this, but the material that's swirling around on its way in, because the black hole can only siphon so much in at a time, gets sped up to near the speed of light, and that obviously creates a lot of energy. Rather, it comes from the space around them, a massive orbiting disk of gas called an accretion disk. Quasars use the same fuel as stars to shine, matter. It's just that black holes are the most efficient engines for converting matter into energy in the universe. The energy released by matter falling into a black hole can be 60 times greater than that released by nuclear fusion in the core of a star, because the energy released by a black hole comes from gravity, not from nuclear reactions. Hmm? Matter falling into a black hole speeds up to almost the speed of light before it crosses the event horizon, yep. buzzing with an incredible amount of kinetic energy. Of course, once inside the black That's hole, a lot of it heat. takes that energy with it. You only get to witness this energy if you drop your matter in the right way. <laughs> Fall straight down and the outside universe gets nothing. But when you have a lot of matter, it spirals in incredibly fast towards the event horizon, forming a disk. Collisions between particles and friction heated up to hundreds of thousands of degrees. In a lot of models, when we're talking about black holes, especially at an entry level, we don't consider that black holes are spinning. It's just a lot easier to explain them and to do the math based on the fact or based on the assumption that they're not spinning. But in reality, all black holes should be spinning. There shouldn't have any static black holes existing because how are black holes formed? Well, when it's formed, the stars are spinning, right? That kinetic energy has to go somewhere. It just doesn't stop and leave you with a black hole that's not spinning. So every single one of them should be spinning. And that complicates things quite a bit, too. In a space not much bigger than our solar system, the core of a galaxy can release many times more energy than all its stars combined. This is what a quasar is. <laughs> a super those, massive uh, food black hole having a feast. And these black holes eat a lot. Typical quasars consume one to a hundred Earth masses of gas per minute. Ten billion years ago, what? the universe was about a third of its current size, so the intergalactic medium was much less spread out, wow. meaning the filaments of gas around quasars could feed them a banquet, making That's them insane. vomit insane amounts of light and radiation. Per minute, the brightest that was. quasars power jets, tangling the magnetic field of the matter around them into a narrow cone. Like a particle accelerator, they Jeez. launch enormous beams of matter out, plowing through the circumgalactic medium, forming plumes of matter that grow to hundreds of thousands of light years in size. Think about that scale for just a second. We're talking an actual ejection plume that's thousands of light years long. Actually, did they say hundreds of thousands of light years? ...medium, forming plumes of matter that grow to hundreds of thousands of light years in size hundreds of thousands of light years that is a powerful jet <laughs> wow it's almost unfathomable in scale it a tiny almost spot it in is unfathomable carving out patches of the universe hundreds of thousands of light years long that's insane but quasars can't eat for long maybe a few million years because their feast ultimately kills their galaxy amateurs <laughs> how quasars kill galaxies Okay, maybe killing is a bit of an exaggeration. A galaxy is still there after its quasar turns off, but it will never be the same again. 
Quasars, being among the hottest and brightest things in the universe, break their galaxies by heating them up too much and stopping star formation. Stars are gas that collapsed in on itself and then got really hot. But in a cloud of gas that's already hot, atoms are moving quickly. When they collide, they hit hard, exerting pressure that resists gravity's squeeze. So hot gas cannot form stars. With the quasar being as bright and as hot as it is, I wonder if the heat actually would, say, fry planets that are capable of having life if they're near enough the galactic center. I'm sure there's probably a safe zone, so to say. But that could be civilization ending, potentially, right, for any advanced life that exists within that galaxy. Or any non-advanced life, too, I suppose, right? I'd be really interested to know what the radiuses of that are, you know, where you would be safe in your galaxy if there is a safe point or if that's just a guaranteed extinction. Instead, because I don't know, gas for forming stars is already cold and won't put up a fight when it's time to collapse into a star. On top of that, quasars push gas out of their galaxies. Not only does this starve the quasar, but its galaxy loses the raw materials for new stars. True. As sad as this sounds, it might be a good thing for life. The alternative can be far more dangerous. Too many stars. Mm. New stars forming is usually followed by massive stars exploding in supernovae, so planets would be burned sterile. But of course, it's more complicated. Like the intricacies of our own planet's biosphere, every piece of the galaxy is dependent on and influencing every other part of mm -hmm. the galactic environment. While hot things like quasars and supernovae tend to push gas out of the galaxy, their animation is and quasar so good. jets can also compress gas, making new stars at least for a short time. But in general, we can say that without things becoming a bit more chill, we would not exist today. Mm. Which brings us to our final question. Did the Milky Way have a quasar in the past? Ooh. It's unclear I don't if think every it galaxy did, did went it? through a quasar phase, but understanding distant hmm. quasars may provide clues to the history of the Milky Way. Galaxies don't do a good job of preserving their history. Like sand on a beach, the endless churning mixes away the clues to their past. Yeah. It's possible the Milky Way was once a quasar, which may have allowed our supermassive black hole Sagittarius A star to have grown to 4 million times the mass of the Sun. Because Sagittarius A is actually very calm at the moment, which hopefully that lasts many, many, many millions of years, right? But it's very calm. So we're kind of living at a really good point in time right now. I mean, it's probably why, one of the reasons why we're here, right? And as dormant as it is now, Sagittarius A star could turn into a quasar in the future. In a few billion years, the Milky Way will merge with Andromeda. Mm -hmm. We've seen over a hundred double quasars in galaxies smashing together, where fresh gas is provided for the central black holes. Mm. But it won't last for long. When galaxies merge, so do their supermassive black holes, sinking into the center of their new galaxy, kicking up dust and stars in every direction. We don't know whether this will happen, but it would truly be an incredible sight. Gravitational Maybe some waves. beings in the far future are going to witness it and be in awe of what they see. Hmm. But you don't have to wait that long. There <laughs> are already plenty of fascinating things to explore right here on this planet right now. If in all honesty, though, Brilliant is a wonderful website and you should check them out if you haven't. I'm not sponsored, but they are pretty great. I, I had a membership for a while. Anyway, this was a wonderful video. We got to learn about quasars and how amazing and large they are especially if you count the plumes as part of them which personally i do that hundreds of thousands of light years a plume is that yeah what <laughs> you can't even fathom that 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 number is so meaninglessly absurd that it just blows my mind 